Hello, and uh, welcome to our talk. Um, both Rina and I, we are super excited and grateful to be speaking at Berlin Buzzwords, and we've been enjoying this event so much. Thank you for having us. And yes, today we're going to talk about documentation and its superpower, how it enables diverse, inclusive, open-source communities. So, my name is Ayah Jamal, and I'm a program manager, and I work with... Uh, open source projects um, related to big data, Apache Beam, Apache Airflow, maybe you've heard of that. And um, yeah, and in these communities, I uh, advocate for more love and uh, more attention for documentation, and I advocate for recognition of non-code contribution. And, okay. um, and my name is Rihanna McNamara. I am a technical writer and a documentation advocate working on Google's open source strategy team. And I've been working in tech in documentation for about a quarter of a century. And there are two things after all that time that I remain really passionate about. And one is documentation. Because documentation is not an afterthought and it is not a nice to have. Documentation, I truly believe, is as fundamental to the discipline of software engineering as testing. It empowers and accelerates great development. And in the time that I've been working in open source, in the very short time, I've begun to realize that it is also critical for diversion and inclusion in technology and in open source. And diversion and inclusion is the other great passion of mine. And since in the last year, I've begun to see documentation and this cause as very, very strongly related. So these terms like diversity, inclusion, and equity, we throw them around a lot, and for a long time, I tended to use them kind of interchangeably. But this is a description I actually really like from Jess Mitchell, where diversity is a number. It simply represents the presence of difference. There's a diversity of nationalities in this room. There's a diversity of opinions about the ending of Game of Thrones. That is just, it is merely the starting point. Um, inclusion is a much better thing, and inclusion is where we actually bring people in. And open source is used the world over, and our communities are, in fact, pretty diverse of users. It is used everywhere, but the community, our communities inclusive. The thing is that software development of all kinds, open source proprietary, it's a deeply complex endeavor. And it's now widely known and accepted that diverse, inclusive teams, we solve problems faster. They make more creative solutions. And diverse, inclusive companies are more profitable, and diverse, inclusive communities are more effective. But unfortunately, as we all know, the community, the contributor base that we have for open source at the moment does not reflect the user base. So let's, when we're looking at diversity, let's have a look at some numbers. And here's, uh, let's look at one axis of diversity. And I just want to make uh, the point that this is a short presentation and there isn't enough time to go into all the different axes of diversity. I'm going to talk here about gender imbalance, and of course I am ignoring all these other things around race, social class, levels of ability, orientation, all the rest, never mind the intersections of these things. But for now, we're going to talk about gender imbalance. And let's assume that in the general population, people identifying as male and female are about equal, while also acknowledging that it doesn't add up to 100%, right? So that's, that's our general population. Let's now look at the world of professional programmers, and it depends, the figures vary depending on how you define a programmer, right? But this one figure, it goes somewhere between 21 and 27%. So the numbers, the diversity is not looking so good there. Let's look at open source. I'm going to help you out there. That's 3%. In the GitHub survey in 2017 of the respondents, 95% were male, 3% were women, and 1% were non-binary. And obviously, this is representing a problem for open source, because when our com communities are not inclusive, when women and underrepresented minorities feel uncomfortable and unwelcome, everybody suffers. Our communities and projects miss out on the skills, creativity, and talent of a huge number of our users. And it's bad for our projects, it's bad for our users. And when we consider that we are now in a world where increasingly a track record of contributions to open source is seen as a prerequisite for getting a job in proprietary software, this imbalance in open source has the potential to make the gender imbalance even worse. 
At Google, we wanted to understand more about this, so we commissioned a study. And we wanted to better understand how, why and how people contribute or do not contribute to open source projects. And here I'm going to hand you off to Ajamal, who's going to tell you more about the study, the process that we took, and the findings of the study. Thank you, Rina. Uh, so we started the process uh, by uh, talking to different um, people at Google that are involved with open source. We talked to project maintainers who are also like software engineers, technical writers, product managers, program managers. And we were looking to understand uh, what kind of challenges they had uh, trying to bring uh, more users and contributors to their projects. And through these conversations, we also wanted to set our expectations, define our research goals, and also talk about what would be the desired outcome from the research so we can benefit a lot of open source projects. And so the goal was to understand who are our users that are using our software, and how do they... Uh, go from being just a user to a community member and contributor. And in their transition from user to contributor, what information needs they have, like what questions they ask. And we were hoping to find answers to these questions. And uh, once we found, we wanted to document everything and document the best practices of how to foster open source contributions. And we interviewed 18 candidates from various uh, backgrounds and all of them recent open source software users. And we discussed their experience with evaluating um, open source technologies. And we especially asked them about the feelings and experience around contributing to open source. And if they weren't contributing, we wanted to know why. What are the barriers? And once these interviews were uh, completed, we collected all the data, all this data, and we grouped them, and we uh, did the thematic analysis to uncover uh, common patterns and themes, and uh, which eventually helped us uh, craft the uh, user archetypes and uh, their journey maps. Uh, so in our study, we actually uh, identified five archetypes. Here you can see only four because, uh, and the other archetype is um, lurkers. Lurkers, they don't uh, interact with the project and we don't know anything about them, so we ignore them for now and we focus on these four who are <laughs> leader, convinced, competent, and curious archetypes. And uh, yeah, let's start with Rory. Rory, she's a leader in open source. She she has like uh, she is an active a member of open source community. She she collaborates with other leaders. Uh, she provides a lot of mentorship. She contributes code and documentation, and she is very well supported by her employer. And uh, but. She loves open source and she wants more people to use open source and, and she doesn't have enough time to convince other teams and business units of value of using and contributing back to open source. And she needs tools to scale and maintain and grow uh, her open source projects. Then there's Avery. Avery, she's, uh, she knows of value of contributing. Uh, she can contribute Docs, she can contribute code, and she's very familiar with the project. She could bring a lot of, uh, like, a lot of value to the project, but she's not doing it yet because her employer doesn't support her. Her employer is skeptic about open source. Uh, he, uh, like, he doesn't know the value of contributing to open source, and Avery, she has to do it on her free time, and it's not very easy. Yesterday in her speech, in, uh, Isabel, she, she was uh, talking about convincing your manager of value of contributing to open source. And that's exactly what Avery needs. She needs help convincing her manager that open source is good to use and open source is, uh, and people need to keep contributing to open source. And then there's Taylor. Uh, Taylor, he's a software engineer. And he's somewhat familiar with the project. He 
sometimes engage with the project. And he contributes code, mostly bug fixes, and he thinks that contributing code is the only way of contribution to open source. He has a lot of expertise uh, in, that he could bring to the project, but he's not confident whether his time is, uh, is spending in the right way, whether it's worth his time, whether his contributions are going to be recognized and rewarded. And Taylor needs to be sold on the value of contribution. Like, he needs to be convinced that he can become a valuable member of the community. And uh, by continuing to contribute, not only code, but documentation, right? So yesterday, Greece and Isabel, they also talked about uh, how we need to recognize and reward uh, people like Taylor to keep them motivated, involved, and keep them active in open source. And that's exactly what Taylor needs. And finally, uh, meet Parker. Parker, she's our heroine, and she's, um, she's very curious about open source, and she would like to use one for her work, at, at her work. But she faces a lot of barriers. First, she's unfamiliar with open source in general. She doesn't know what the process is, what the like, license is about, and she doesn't know um, ethics and how people interact. And she might not even be familiar with uh, tools and platforms like GitHub, and, and she doesn't know whether her employer will be happy if she starts using it, right? And Parker loves the idea of open source, however, and she would love to contribute back someday, but she's, because she's not engineer, she doesn't know uh, whether she can bring anything valuable to the project. So she might be also nervous because she might not speak English as a first language, so she might not be able to understand very like advanced documentation, and and she might even experience like harassment in the web. So it's very like scary to get involved. And Parker, she needs all the support that you can give her so she can get started. Like, and you need to show her like, how it's done, like how to file your first PR, how to like, just set expectation. Okay, it takes a like, couple days to get your, uh, what is it, PRs approved, or a couple months, or whatever, right? And I assume that many people in this room, uh, you like, might be like Rory, like leader in open source, or a very experienced contributor like Avery, but I really want to talk about Parker uh, today because she's uh, where we start in the beginning. Like I was Parker like a couple months ago, right? And when I just started contributing. And I want us to uh, see how she becomes a uh, user of open source and how she grows into contributor in the open source. Or maybe she doesn't grow into contributor. Let's find out. So. How does Parker pick a project? How she becomes a user, right? Uh, there are many available options, libraries, and how does she choose the right one? She starts by looking into available options. Uh, and once she finds uh, one software the project that looks promising, she does a quick assessment for fit. Will it, uh, will it work with my team, with my environment? Like, will I be able to understand this? And she wants to be able to sift out the project uh, projects that she can't work with like quickly. Like she doesn't want to spend like one month studying the project and not be able to use it at the end. And if the project passes her sniff test, uh, she needs to understand if the project is healthy and well maintained. So she does it by looking. Uh, at statistics in GitHub, like how many stars, downloads, how uh, often the releases are, how, like, uh, how recent the commits are. And uh, she also like, overviews documentation at this stage quickly uh, because she wants to make sure that they exist so she can rely on them later. And only once uh, she's sure that the project is healthy and active. Only after that, she starts digging into code itself and 
she needs to be able to create a map of the technology and understand whether it's a good fit for her use case. And she also wants to, uh, she wants help getting up and running very quickly by doing the quick starts and tutorials. And all of the people that we spoke to, uh, they mentioned that documentation was so critical at this phase and well-maintained and structured, accessible, available documentation was a strong signal that the project is uh, healthy. And, of course, before adopting any open source technology, people like Parker, she wants to make sure that there will be no like, legal complications like of using free software, right? She wants to uh, know whether there's uh, any documentation available that explains like legal policies and whether she can pass them on to her legal team for assessment. And Isabel also mentioned that like everyone before adopting a new technology, they ask these questions and it's very important. And you need to make sure that you have it. So once Parker is able to answer all of those questions, she is ready to adopt the technology and she starts using it. And she's excited about technology because it's free, it's fun, it helps her do her work. And as she keeps using software, as it always happens, she eventually runs into a bug or some problem, right? And, and she starts digging into documentation and she starts reaching out to people in social uh, channels to, uh, to find the solution. And after hard work, a lot of hours spent on the research, she, she finally finds a solution. And she's excited about it. She, she knows, uh, she has an idea and she knows how to fix it, right? And at this stage, uh, Parker is adapting the project, making it better because she is to, like, making a fix for the bug, right? And, and she's happy about it because she knows her fix is good and it would benefit everyone in the community. It would save a lot of trouble and time for many others that will use the same software. And she really wants to contribute back. But she has never created any PR or submitted a fix, so it's a big barrier for her. And let's imagine even she, like she comes and she wants to contribute back, she talks to her boss and her boss is not supportive and uh, she says like, oh, we don't pay you for your open source contributions, don't spend time on it. And it's, and it's very hard and like she starts thinking about all of this and she starts thinking about like, whether her fix is good enough, whether it's valuable, whether uh, people are going to call Parker that she's not good enough, that she's asking stupid questions. So, so it's very daunting, it's very scary. And at this stage, it becomes very uh, easy for Parker not to share rather than share her fix. And um, because the act of contribution Contributing to open source itself is very vulnerable and exposes you in front of all these people, right? And she doesn't have bandwidth to deal with all of this, and it's a lot of pressure and it's stressful. And then let's imagine she decides not to contribute back. And it's really, really sad story because it happens all the time. And if, she, if Parker decides not to contribute back, we all lose, right? Parker loses the opportunity to become like valuable member of the community. Uh, the project loses because it would benefit greatly from her fix. And also her employer loses because they don't have this uh, proof that they can show to their customers and be like, hey, we are very active in open source communities as Isabel was mentioning yesterday. So, how can we help Parker? Like how we can ensure that she doesn't feel this way and actually makes her way to her first contribution? And do you have any ideas, Rina? I have some ideas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Ajmal. Let's rewind this a little bit. So how might the story have turned out better? 
What if Parker had been able to access the information she needed at every step of her journey? Because let's remember that Parker is brand new to open source. She's not an engineer. She doesn't have a lot of support internally or externally. Maybe English isn't her first language, and she may not be uncomfortable in online communities. These are all challenges that she faces, but let's also acknowledge that she is smart as a whip, she has a ton to contribute, and she has unique perspectives that are a value of that. So how might that turn out? What might we get if she actually felt supported at every stage of the journey? Is that the case? It's actually not really the case today far too much. So in the next few slides, I want to talk a little bit about why documentation is so critical in this journey, what documentation you need at every stage of the journey, and touch a little bit about how you can get that documentation. This is a really sad story. According to the Open Source Survey, incomplete or outdated information is a pervasive problem observed by 93% of the population, and this is horrifying. Because open source, any kind of software, is such a deeply complex and highly collaborative endeavor. Documentation is a critical part of it. Yet even now, it's super common to hear people say that documentation is not that necessary. Still, 25 years later, I hear engineers say things like, just read the code. You don't need documentation. This is actually a real-life query that I saw in Quora. I redacted the name because I'm a good person. <laughs> but the, it's, it's along with the same query, some other answers were, read the code commit by commit, then you can learn to understand it. You know who has the time for that? An awful lot of people specifically do not have the time for that. This is one example. Uh, the UN study uh, shows that women the world over do 2.6. 2.6 times the amount of unpaid labor that men do. Women do, that represents hours and hours of day of unpaid work than men on average. And that means that we need to acknowledge the free time to open, contribute and use open source as a privilege. People like Parker, many people just do not have the time to go and read the code commit by commit. We need documentation that explains the project and the code and clearly outlines the processes of the community. So people without this leisure time and employer support to investigate, lack of documentation is an incredibly effective barrier to con contribution. Another one is that we may think of ourselves as a friendly community, but the truth is that not everybody experiences the internet in the same way, and not everybody feels safe reaching out. For example, women are far more likely to um, encounter language or content that makes them feel unwelcome, as well as stereotypical behavior and even harassment on the web. And unsurprisingly then, women and un un to represent minorities are far less likely to reach out to strangers and ask for help in forums or in other things. So in this circumstance, lack of documentation is an incredibly effective barrier to contribution. Here's another one. Nearly a quarter of the open source community speaks and reads English less than very well. Again, this adds complexity to how you find information and makes you less confident when you're reaching out to people. When people, in this case, when English is the de facto language of software development and we don't have clear, easily readable documentation, that's an, a, an effective barrier to contribution. And another area is that not everybody comes into open source with the same level of expertise or the same level of background or something. Parker, we see as a data analyst, not an engineer. If we don't have documentation that accommodates for every level of expertise and provides an on-ramp for everybody who might use our software, that is an incredibly effective barrier to participation and contribution. The fact is, as Ijamal said, contributing and even using open source software requires ourselves to be incredibly vulnerable and open ourselves up to criticism from not even like in the workplace where we know people and they are paid to help us, but from an anonymous people the world over. It is an incredibly terrifying thing. And this was echoed by everybody in our study. Not even, not just the Parkers and the beginners, everybody, even experienced people, experienced this self-doubt when they were putting out their PRs. They were, they were afraid to ask questions and they were afraid to, because they might sound stupid and they were afraid to answer questions because they might, their answers might get torn apart. So, how can we then, let's talk about the documentation, how can we empower people to take this leap? Because it's incredibly rewarding. 
What is the information that we can provide? Clear, accessible information available to all that describes the project, its code, the open source world, and the processes and norms of our community. So what I want to do is just look at Parker's journey and just talk about the specific documentation needs that she has at every stage. So when she is investigating a project, she needs to know straight up front things that will allow her to eliminate a project because it's not a fit for her team. Make sure that really up front on your documentation, you have very discoverable things that outlines the basics, platform, languages, other compatibility, but also things like use cases. These are really important things, not only for Parker, will this solve her problem, but it allows her to take it to her manager or her boss and say, this is something our business should be investing in. They also want to know, can they get started quickly? How hard is it going to be to ramp up? Clear getting started guides and tutorials are going to be really important here. And at this stage, they're going to be looking at the documentation itself, this quick start information, but they're also really going to be looking at the presence. Even if they don't dig into the documentation, the presence of it is such a strong proxy that this is going to be well supported on your journey. And Isabel uh, touched on this very strongly, and actually Chris talked about this, about people who can share their use cases. Because if you're not supported, you need, um, I think it's like the majority of people in the GitHub survey said that they, their work employers had very unclear policies and understandings around using and contributing to open source. So the more resources that you can provide, especially use cases, and then documentation about the requirement. And then she also needs to just learn about getting started with GitHub. You don't need to document GitHub, but you need to make sure that there are clear pointers to that and make sure that her baby steps are well documented. So this is an example of the kind of things they look at. People specific, these are some uh, documentation sets that our respondents identified as being particularly helpful to them and that were decision making. And they explicitly called out navigation like this is a really strong quality for it. So when she gets into it, this is where the standard, typical engineering documentation comes in. This is where things like API references, um, overviews, um, how-to guides, tutorials, troubleshooting, standard core engineering documentation becomes very important, but it's very important that this exists, but it also supports all levels of expertise. We cannot presuppose too much knowledge around that. And we also need to make sure that they know where to find other sources of help. People are less happy even asking questions, but they're a little happier reading answers to other people's questions. And again, at this stage, navigation and organization is very important. Um, and at this stage, when she's digging in, it becomes really critical that uh, your doc set is searchable. Because at this stage, in the early stage, they're looking to make a decision. But when they're implementing, they need to go back and find information over and over again. They know what they're looking for now, and they need to be able to find it. So search becomes really important in this stage. So once she has this and she is using it and she gets this trigger, she makes the fix. It's very, very important. The most important factor is psychological safety. We need a friendly and well-moderated community. And we can help by this by providing written guidelines accessible both to the maintainers and the community, but also to new people that describe how best to moderate and review PRs, how to do it in a way that is safe and welcoming. And that is really important, especially remembering that Parker may not have had positive experiences on the internet in the past. Another area is that um, Parker may experience a lot of self-doubt. She's not sure how she can con contribute. So clear, welcoming documentation that really makes her feel welcome, acknowledges that she brings perspectives, and provides a lot of options to contribute. You may not be an engineer, but as we say, there's a lot, and Gris's talk yesterday talked about this a lot. There's user management, there's documentation, obviously, um, but there's also organizing meetups, program management, triage, all sorts of ways that people can effectively do it. And one thing that's worth bearing in mind here is that a lot of um, women and underrepresented minorities may not feel comfortable re putting themselves forward. If you notice a new user in the community and they're, doing, they're lodging issues, they found an issue with the docs, it's worth considering reaching out to them 
and suggesting and saying, you made a really good point here and you bring this fresh perspective. You are in a position to identify gaps in the documentation, which our seasoned users are not. We would welcome, please um, acknowledge and contribute to your documentation. And once people do that, it's really, really important that we recognize and celebrate non-code contributions, obviously including, but not limited, but obviously including documentation. And there's so many ways of doing that, and one thing is like, put documentation updates in your release notes, just like you put feature and code updates. Go and give public thanks that acknowledges people in the mailing lists. This is a a good thing to do and an encouraging thing to do, but it can also help people overcome barriers with their employers because they can take this and demonstrate the value of what they are bringing to the community. There's a lot of other ways, and there's, I just discovered this uh, GitHub project, Recognize All Contributors, which is an awesome way of putting people's faces. It pulls the names and things and puts it right into your documentation where everybody can see it. And it also supports things like non-code contributions, and I'll tweet out the link to that later on. So when Parker contributes to this, everybody wins. She gets to grow and to feel good and to be part of a community. Obviously, the project's users all get the benefits of her fix. The community is stronger, and even her employer benefits. Um, it's more efficient. If her fix is integrated upstream, then when you upgrade, there's one less thing to worry about. And it's also something like a PR thing that her employer can do. So it's really important. So let's recap some of the key messages that we have here. Lack of documentation is a highly effective barrier to adoption and contribution. And in a world where communities are vital to project health, code quality and adoption, we need this kind of documentation. Its lack is particularly um, harmful to underrepresented groups, including people who have limited time, speak English, who have lower level of expertise, or feel unsafe in online communities. Psychological safety is paramount. Open source requires us to be vulnerable. We can make people feel safe and welcome in the community with good documentation, a friendly and well-moderated community, and active contributions that provide a model for new contributors. The kind, to build psychological safety and empower contributions, we need to provide documentation that clearly describes the project, its code, and the community. And this is what builds safety and confidence. Just as in the Apache way, decision-making is made in the open, documentation is how we get tribal knowledge out of the heads of people and put it in the hands of where it is accessible to everybody. Docs or it didn't happen. <laughs> it doesn't exist. And we need to seek out support and recognize documentation contributions. We need to make it as easy as possible to be contribute. We need to reach out to people, provide clear lines, and we need to be responsive and kind. It sounds like table stakes, and everybody in this room understands that. So at the beginning of this talk, we talked about diversity, inclusion, and we haven't yet really touched on equity. The open source world is already diverse. It is used the world over by all sorts of engineers. When we create documentation that enables everybody to contribute to our project, we make those communities more inclusive. But documentation has the power to do an awful lot more. We talk about this world now where a track record of open source contribution can be a pathway to employment, and that means it is a pathway to economic advancement. Think about people, some people have gone to universities, gotten CS degrees, some people are going through the boot camp route, they are doing this as their chance for a new role and to enter this field. Documentation can be a really powerful tool for equity and inclusion. Tribal knowledge concentrates power in the hands of the privileged few. It's inefficient, which is why we do everything on the list, but it's also harmful. And we know this at a really intuitive level. All of us grew up with fairy stories where one of the myths is the young hero or heroine who needs to find the book of knowledge. Because universal access to knowledge threatens the dominant order. And there is a reason, for example, that it was a crime to teach enslaved people to read. 
And everyone here in this room, and I feel this very, really strongly about myself, we all, just by being in this room, are experiencing a really strong level of privilege. Right? We all have different levels of privilege, right? But to be here at this conference, for those of us who are not German, we were all able to get a visa and enter this country. We all understand English enough to have these conversations and do this. Our employers probably paid for us to be here, but in any way, we're economically able to be here. For people with kids, we have somebody to watch those kids. And just by being here, everyone here, and I'm, this is my first buzzwords, and I'm feeling this really strongly, we are building networks and connections, we are building social capitals that will grow our careers and our economic status. And after this conference, we're going to feel so much more comfortable reaching out to people that we met here today. And there's nothing wrong with having that privilege. But in a world where participation in open source can be a path to economic advancement, to promote not just diversity and inclusion, but also equity, we can use that privilege. If we ensure that we document our community norms and practices and our projects and codes, the knowledge needed to navigate our, our communities is available to everybody, we promote equity. If we do what we can to make sure that that knowledge is accessible to everyone, regardless of language or ability or social capital, we promote equity. And if we give people the knowledge they need to participate in this amazing industry, to take advantage of the economic advancement it offers, we promote equity. And if we seek out contributions from underrepresented groups and give them opportunities, we promote equity. Knowledge is power, and documentation is how we make that power to ev available to everyone. Thank you very much for having us here. It has been a privilege. Thank you. All right, so we saw from this talk and from the keynotes as well that there are a lot of ways to contribute to open source project uh, other than uh, donating and contributing source code. That's yes. good to, to know. And I think we have uh, time for one question. Yes, I will pass around the mic. Thank you, uh, great talk. You mentioned briefly something that I think is an incredible asset that a new contributor has to a project, and I wish it had a name, because I think all of us seasoned people that have API blindness, we totally don't understand the perspective of a new contributor. I've heard it called a very unique tool that is very sharp, but quickly dulls. I think if we could identify that and name this amazing quality that new contributors bring to a project, that would be an amazing draw, because these people bring something incredibly special that we all have lost. I agree. I, I, if, what I think you're describing is an obliviousness to blind spots. Right. We have blind spots. New people do not. And that's incredibly special. Yeah. So we should be seeking out these people that have, mm -hmm. don't have those blind spots. Exactly, especially when you think about things like we take certain skill levels for granted, right? So we don't document things for beginners. Yes, I, I would love to have a conversation about how to, what we should call that and we how we We need a name for it. And I've we heard do. a name and I oh. lost the name and I, I have my own tremendous API blindness, but if we could give it a name that would spread, I think that would just be an incredible draw to help us grow our communities. And what I is the name? I don't have the name yet. We, that is our task, yes. is to come yeah. up with that. That is a good conversation over coffee. It's, it's what a newcomer has that's the opposite of API blindness. What is API blindness? API blindness is when you're so f familiar with your source code and your processes in GitHub that you don't even understand what a new person feels when they try to join your project. All of the barriers that they hit, because you don't see those barriers anymore. You're so comfortable right. with your community and your processes. It's so kind a newcomer, because they, with that, they can tell you what are the barriers to the other newcomers that are trying to join your project. And if we fix those, the process just accelerates. It becomes an awesome flywheel. So we need a name for it that we all can agree on. And yeah. So I was suggesting that we refer to that as user empathy, especially new user empathy, 
trying to understand precisely those sticky points and where it, like folks get kind of like hold and then dropped from the funnel. So how do we prevent that attrition from the journey? We can start the thread and mm -hmm. uh, suggest Let's start and a vote on that. Perfect. Let's start yeah. a thread. <laughs> I think that's a very interesting conversation, but uh, let's stick to the schedule. Maybe you can take this discussion offline with the speakers and uh, everyone. <laughs> so let's thank uh, the speakers again. Thank you very much, Rina and Ajamal.